Continuing through Mark chapter 5. We're going to finish the chapter together. So if you want to turn there, Mark chapter 5. I'll get there with you guys. And our specific passage, we're going to primarily be in, we're going to be, you know, in verses 35 through 43. But this, uh, this section actually begins, because uh, if you read through this, you'll notice there's another incident that's tucked in the middle of this one. So we'll start in Mark 5, 21, and then we'll skip down. After a few verses, we'll skip down to 35. Mark 5, 21. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. And then he'll skip down to verse 35. While he was still speaking, that is Jesus, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Don't be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. Verse 39, when he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child's not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talita kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given to her to eat. And so, what's interesting, in all three of the synoptic gospels, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the healing of Jairus' daughter and the woman with the issue of blood, they're told as one intertwined account. Every single one starts out with Jairus and then this woman and then back to uh, his daughter. And so last week, you know, not attempting, um, wanting to attempt too much in one sermon, you know, bite off more than I can chew, uh, I separated the story of just you know, the healing of the woman, which I skipped that part this morning, which Mark details out right in verses 25 through 34. So if you're not familiar with that, you can read that, read that later. But so today, keeping the woman's healing in mind, we're going to put the story back together and focus on Jairus and the healing of the daughter, of, of his daughter. You know, and what... So often, uh, what we're really good at doing as Christians, we study the Bible. You know, we, we break it down and we tear it apart and we dig into it. But really, the job's not done until we put it back together. There's something that happens when you, you need to break it down and you need to get into it. And then you need to put the pieces back together and see what is it telling me. Because when the author wrote it, he didn't just write one thing in isolation. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's part of a bigger, oftentimes, right? The majority of the time, it's in a bigger context. 
and really every book of the Bible is in the context of the overall Bible. So I titled my message this morning, When Bad Goes to Worse, Don't Fear, Only Believe. And that's, that's my main thought that I want us to keep in mind and consider today. When we've come to the Lord with our urgent situation, and like the man in the story, we've got down on our knees and earnestly begged for his help in prayer, calling on the name of Jesus. And instead of things getting better, they become even worse and even more hopeless. What is our response? How do we handle that scenario when bad goes to worse? Especially when we've, I'm doing the right thing, all right? I, 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 I've come to Jesus, I've come to the Lord, I've called on his name, I'm praying. I'm trying to do the right thing, and it's going, it goes from bad and it gets worse. And the question is, do we continue in faith and belief, or we, do we succumb to fear and doubt? And really, that's, when you boil it down, you've got two options. You're already in a bad situation. And now it gets worse. What are you going to do? Do you succumb to the hopelessness of fear? Or do you press on in faith and belief? And so in verse 22, you know, just like the afflicted woman we read last week who had heard about Jesus, Jairus came to Jesus and fell at his feet. This is one of the rulers of the synagogue held in high respect among, among the religious Jews. And the interesting thing is, it doesn't matter your position, your title, your place in the community. When things get bad enough, you get desperate enough, you're willing to come and humble yourself. If you think, if you think there's help, you'll go for that help if you really want it. And so, you know, the woman, she had heard about Jesus. She knew his power, what he could do. Well, Jairus had heard the same thing, obviously. He does the same exact thing, doesn't he? But he came right up to Jesus, right, and fell down at his feet. <coughs> his situation was urgent, too, and he knew that Jesus was his daughter's only hope. Verse 23, right? He begged Jesus earnestly. My little daughter, let me tell you what's going on, Jesus. I'm so glad I found you. My little daughter lies at the point of death. She is literally about ready to die any moment. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and I know she'll leave. So he has total confidence and faith. He's in the right place. He's come to the right person. He has faith in Jesus. And he's confident, if you lay your hands on her, I know she'll live. And so, without delay, what does Jesus do? He goes with him. He doesn't, you know, take time to preach a message or whatever. He's like, let's go. Sounds like it's pretty bad, you know. And then the great multitude follows Jesus as well. And in the heart of Jairus, where there was no hope, he's made it to Jesus, and now he's got hope. And Jesus is actually coming. There's still time for his daughter to be healed and be helped. He made it to Jesus. They're on the way, and he's just praying if she can only hold on a little bit longer, if we can get there, right? Time is of the F essence. If we're quick enough, um, he's, he's hopeful, he's confident that the situation can be turned around. And then, as we read last week, something unexpected happens. <laughs> right? So Jesus, he's focused. They're going, hey, how far is it to your house? Let's go. Let's get there. And something unexpected happens. Someone in the crowd, there was another daughter who also had a desperate need who knew that Jesus was her last and only hope. 
And as we, we, we talked about, she reached out to Jesus in faith. And what happened? She was completely healed. And Jesus immediately, he sensed, he's like, whoa, power went out of me. I just healed another one. Power went out of him. And he stopped everything to address the one who had been made well. As this was taking place now, with the attention and the focus of Jesus diverted from continuing, right? He was making haste to the home of Jairus. And now he's been, his attention and focus has been diverted. What do you think began to grow in the Father's heart? He was like, whoo, man, we made it in time. If we're quick, she'll still be alive when we get there. Do you think that anxiety, you know, wait a minute, whoa, who's butting in? I mean, I thought Jesus was going with me. Who butted in here? How'd this happen? I, w I would, if, you, if we were in that position, I think, you ever been there? We're like, come on, this is urgent. We got to get moving, you know, anxiety, worry, fear that they're going to be too late to save his daughter, I'm sure began to build in his heart. We gotta keep this moving. Jesus is wrapping up, you know? Yeah. Get her number. <laughs> <laughs> Text her later, right? But a miraculous healing had just taken place privately until Jesus asked the woman to publicly testify how her flow of blood that she had suffered from for 12 years had instantly been dried up in a moment as she touched, you know, the edge of his robe. Nobody but, you know, for a moment there, nobody but her and Jesus knew what happened, right? And so, Jesus, he looks right, he stopped everything, he looked around, and he was asking, who touched me? Or he said, who touched my clothes? And the disciples were like, are you serious? You see this huge crowd, multitude thronging you, mobbing you, and you're asking who touched you? But he's like, no, someone touched me in faith, and they were healed. And so it says there in the passage, after she shares the whole truth, Jesus says to her daughter, right? I said there was, there was two daughters in this passage. There's a grown daughter, and there's a little daughter. But she was still a daughter. He, and he speaks this word of, you know, of en endearment. My little daughter, right? Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And so that's all good. And then what Jairus feared most happens. Bad goes to worse. They're too late. Right? They're standing there. There's nothing you can do. Jesus is the healer. He's the teacher. He's the Messiah. He's the man. If he's going to stop and talk to someone, hey, you're at his mercy. You have to stand there and go, well, because we're going to talk to this lady and how she got healed. And I just hope we're in time. And then the word comes. No, you're, you're not in time. Right? Verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking to the woman... Some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Hey, your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher any, any further? Hey, sorry, there's no, no use in having them come to the house. It's, it's too late. And before Jairus can even process what he's just been told, we read in the passage, As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken in him, he, he, you know, it's another divine intervention. He, he, he heads it off before, literally, he's just heard it, before he can even really, it can sink in. Before the devastation fully hits his heart, he turns to Jairus and says, don't be afraid. Only believe. I mean, you can imagine the shock you're standing there. You ever had news, right? And you probably have 
you get the phone call or someone tells you something and your mind is just trying to catch up with what you just heard. You, you've heard it, but you're trying to process it. Like, did this really happen? Did you, what you said just, I remember, I, I remember a phone call. One of my, my best friends had passed away and I'm just like, what? What, what you're saying doesn't make sense. Right? So I was trying to process it. What do you mean? In the same exact moment that grief and sorrow threatened to swallow Jairus alive, as he realizes that death has outraced them and taken his daughter and all hope is gone, something enters the situation that turns everything completely upside down and says, don't worry, it's not too late. No matter what it looks like, it's not too late. And what was that something? There's two things. The words and the works of Christ enter into this situation. And what Jairus had just witnessed Jesus stopping everything, you know, if Jesus hadn't have stopped everything and called attention to it, what would have, have what would have gone completely unrecognized in, in our passage? He had already witnessed the reversal of an impossible situation, right? But unless Jesus had stopped and called attention to it, he would have totally been oblivious to it. Something he needed to hear and understand, and so would everybody else, but especially Jairus. For 12 years, this woman has suffered many things from many physicians, it says in Mark 5. And it says that she spent all that she had in desperation trying to seek uh, a cure and a solution and after all that, after everything, after going to the best doctors, trying everything that they would suggest, you know, taking every medicine available, maybe undergoing some procedures, whatever, spending all she had, uh, we read in verse 26, she was no better, but rather grew worse. And so in her situation, Prior to meeting Jesus, bad had gone to worse. That's literally what it says in the passage. Not being any better, rather, she grew worse after all her best efforts, right? Every available means, all her resources, the situation had gone from bad to worse for her as well. And what was the solution? Rather than fearing that she would never be made well, when she heard about Jesus, she determined to get to him. And she trusted and believed in his power to perform the impossible. She heard about a man who could do, do the impossible. And she trusted and she believed in that. And she said, I'm going to get to him. And when she did, she was made perfectly whole. And so looking at this passage together, like, we took it apart, right, to look at the woman. But putting it together, it's kind of like, why are these two stories being told together? It's kind of like, why are we got two? Well, I ever watched a show and got several plot lines going. Those are some of the best shows, right? And then we get to the end, it's like, whoa, you see how, oh, well, that was good writing. Well, this is, this is reality, but this is good writing of the gospel writer showing these two stories together. And how many of us know and believe that with God, there's no coincidences. There's no chance that Jairus just happened to be there and, you know, at this time, and then this happens, and he's witnessing it. That these two people's lives and circumstances would intersect at the point of their greatest need in the presence of Jesus. Fascinating. I mean, there's no coincidence. God had been orchestrating this for a long time. 
And so Jairus, having just witnessed the miraculous work of Christ, and having received a direct word from Jesus, what was the word that he received? Don't be afraid. Only believe. Now he has a choice to make. He can either accept that his daughter has died and that there's nothing more to be done and not trouble the teacher anymore. That's one choice. Or by faith, continue with Jesus to where? Into the realm of the impossible and see what God wants to do in this situation. And really, what, would, what does he have to lose? It would be, how, how awful would it be at this point just to say, well, we did our best. I tried to get to Jesus as quick as I could, you know, and hey, you know, maybe even without this interruption, um, maybe she still would have died before we got there. That, that would be one thing, and just to accept it and just be, you know, start the mourning process. Or he has... Number one, he's seen an impossible miracle and just heard about it, witnessed it, and had, you know, firsthand heard testimony of this woman. Twelve years, impossible to cure the situation, never stopped flowing blood, totally weak, you know, totally demoralized, isolated, all the things we talked about, financially ruined, trying to get a cure, and coming in the presence of Jesus and touching his robe, access that power. He just he just witnessed that the work of what Christ could do, the power of Jesus. And then to have the have the word of Jesus, don't be afraid, only believe. Why not? What do you got? I mean, go with Jesus. And that's what that's what he does, right? And as we read, he decides to walk not by sight, but by faith. And go with Jesus beyond the natural and into the supernatural. That's the invitation. Don't be afraid. Just come with me. I'm going to show you what's about to happen. And at this point, in verse 37, Jesus you know, dismisses the multitude that was following and thronging him now. And he doesn't permit anyone to, but his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, to follow him. And Jesus knows this is not a time for unbelief or doubt or for spectators or a carnival atmosphere. Who oh, we will see another miracle? You know. Jesus says, no, I'm not only, you know, the mother, the father, and my inner circle. And when he comes to the house of the synagogue ruler, what is the, uh, you know, what's the scene like? It says that it was chaos. It was a bunch of commotion of those who were weeping and wailing loudly. And he knows that he needs to, you know, dismiss them from the situation too. And if you come to the, if you came to a scene like that, of grieving and weeping and all this, and if you're not familiar, they, they grieve in a completely different way than we do. When you, when you read that in the, the verse there, it's, it's quite a loud, you know, outward expression, very demonstrative of grief. Not, you know, quiet, tears running, you know, just some tears running down the cheek. It's like everyone's losing it. Everyone's full-blown, top of your lungs, losing it, right? But how do you interrupt all these professional mourners and people weeping and grieving? And I say professional mourning mourners because they would actually hire people that, that was, it'd be like going to the funeral home, except you could uh, say, hey, you want to have 20 professional mourners really raise a rocket just to show how much we, we love this person is what it was about. It was like this person meant so much to us. And so they would hire people to help with expressing the depth of the grief the family felt at the loss they were experiencing. So culturally, it's 
quite a bit different than probably most of us have experienced. And so when you go into that scene, how do you grab everyone's attention, interrupt it, and get them out? Say something ridiculous. Ridiculous unless you're the son of God. Right? Verse 39, what does he say? When he came in, he said to them, Why are you guys making all this ruckus? What's all the commotion and the weeping and the tears and all the wailing? You know? Child's not dead, but sleeping. And what does it say? It says he said something ridiculous because they ridiculed him. And they laughed him to scorn. It's like, dude, are you serious? You really come in here and just say, I like the worst thing talking about, you know, talking about the worst thing you can just say to somebody when they lost their loved one. Because we're not very skilled at we're not, we weren't designed by God to experience death. So most of us, I mean, there's a couple people who have figured out how to be compassionate and mainly probably don't say anything, listen, and be smart, but there's others that to say all the worst things. Well meaning, but but Jesus says, Really? What is all this about? You know, she's only sleeping. And so they ridicule him. You know, for for you and I to have said that the little girl was sleeping when she had died, it would it would be ridiculous if we said that. Why? Because we're powerless in the face of death. And everybody knows that. But for Jesus, bringing her back to life is as effortless as if you and I were to go into our kids' room and wake them up from a nap. Not only does what Jesus says speak to his authority over death, but also it's an indication that her current condition would only be temporary because he knew he was about to raise her. Right? Someone who's taking a nap, that's just a temporary condition. Why? Because they're going to wake up. Sooner or later, right? It's just a nap. It's not forever sleep. And so, Jesus, you know, uh, the other thing, you know, he has no interest in performing this miracle in a circus-like environment, right? You know, it's no slam against them. It was their cultures the way they did it. But he's not, he's just not going to perform this miracle with all this chaos and everything going on. It's not, pro, it's not appropriate. And he says, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to, you guys need to go. This was for the girl's father and mother and for the three closest disciples to witness alone. This is not, you know, for your entertainment, your amazement, your wonder, your enjoyment. No, there's a mother and a father who have lost their little girl, and they're devastated, and they're brokenhearted. And so some of the, you know, it's interesting, some of the, probably most of the miracles, they're all performed publicly, very public. This one is, is done in complete privacy. And I think it just shows the grace of Jesus, his, his respect, his love, his care uh, for the parents, for the situation. And so after they adopted the scorn, which he knew they would, which was kind of right by design, Jesus is like, this is going to grab their attention. And then they're all going to think I'm crazy and whatever, and then I can tell them, I was okay, get out of here. <laughs> right now there's like this little bit of tension and opposition. He's like, okay, good, I don't want you in here anyways. But after he does that, which we know he said for his own purposes, he puts everybody out. And the, the word says he took only the father and the mother and those who were with him, and they entered where the child was lying. And there in the calm and the quiet of that moment, that's where Jesus chooses to do the impossible. 
And he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement, which would be an understatement. <laughs> If any of us were there, we would be overcome with amazement at what we had just witnessed. And, you know, teaching this passage, I think one of the mistakes we can make is to try to over-spiritualize something and say, okay, now in this passage, okay, you're this person, and then this person represents this, and this, this, and then, you know, what are we trying, it's an attempt where we try to make a formula out of what we want the outcome we're trying to understand and so sometimes that, that's what we can do we try to make it you know a formula okay if we find ourselves in this situation okay what you need to do is this and then God he'll be beholden to you because he always does this if you do this and he, he has to do that you know it's in the Bible that's like this is the formula, you know, A plus B equals C, you and then God and then the outcome, you know. So we do have to be careful of kind of making it an allegory or over-spiritualizing it. But what I see, I see two people, right? You got Jairus. We know it's his daughter, but we see him. He's the one who's bringing the need. He's the one standing in the place for her. And then we see, you know, the woman with the issue of blood. And so we see their two accounts intertwined. And what's really cool, it's, it's representative of, you know, it's like a sample of the severe situations of those who thronged Jesus and came to, you know, him for help, what, what they had. Right? It's a good sample of, like, Here's a couple of illustrations of real people who had overwhelming, impossible situations. And we know that he dealt with countless and untold people with every kind of tragedy and affliction. And he healed and delivered everyone who came to him in faith. That's what we read in the Gospels, don't we? Whoever came to him in faith got to him. They, they were healed. And so, these, these, you know, we don't try to put ourselves in it, but at the same time, they're like, they're like all of us that they face impossible situations that we have no control over, right? That are uh, serious and they're severe and they're heartbreaking. And we're, we're wanting God or coming to him for the solution, for the cure. And so by way of application, how many of us have found ourselves in the middle of bad situations? Probably almost everyone in the room could raise their hand and be like, okay, yeah, I, yes, I found myself in one, two, too many to count, you know, bad situations. How about situations that actually go from bad to worse after we've come to Jesus, after we've started praying and seeking the Lord's help, wait a minute, I thought this was going to get better. I'm coming to the Lord. I'm attending church. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. What is going on here? Why is this getting worse? Why does it seem to be going the wrong direction? I thought I was going to get, you know, some help. And so, it's, it's extremely applicable to us. We don't have to over-spiritualize it to make it relatable. It's totally practical. And when that happens, we have a choice to make. That's what the passage you know, is teaching us. When you've got to that situation, you're praying, you're crying out, you're reaching for the Lord. It goes from bad to worse. Now, we can either walk by sight and accept things the way they are and just go, it gets to a certain point, you know, well, that's just the way it goes. 
I guess this the, it's over. We had the story's written on this one. It's never, it's not, there's nothing we can do, man. It's out of our hands. So that's a choice you can make. You could be in your bad situation that's gone to worse and just go, well, oh, guess we'll have to live with it. It'll never change, man. I've tried, I've prayed, I've done this, I've done that. Or we can do something else. We can do what they did in the passage. We can turn to the words and the works of Christ. When I talk about the works of Christ, I'm saying when we're in that situation, we can choose to remember all the things that God has already done in our life. How many bad situations, impossible situations, pickles has he got us out of? Where there's no good option. You go this way or this way, I mean, you're out, right? It's a bad, there's no, no solution, right? But how many times has he, you know, well, we're thinking, well, it's either this or this. And he's like, no, it's not A or B, it's option C. I had an option you didn't even know was on the table. You know? What about in the lives of others? So why we're talking about the importance of testimonies. You know, like we had our testimony night on, on and worship night a couple Sunday nights ago. That's why Jesus told the demoniac, I'm not going to allow you to come with me though you want to come with me. I understand. But I want you to go home, you know, and tell the great things that the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. And he immediately went out and they all became amazed and he became an evangelist. With only, I mean, he's like a one day old Christian, but he's got a story to tell. I was hopelessly lost, bound by untold amounts of evil spirits. And I came to Jesus, and out of word, he delivered me. And I found myself clothed, seated, and in my right mind, which I hadn't been for years. They tried to chain me and shackle me because I was out of my mind, crazy. And no one could bind me. I would break all the chains. And I was crazy. And I lived in the tombs and the graveyard. And I cut myself with stones. And I cried out day and night. And I was violent. And no one wanted to have anything to do with me. And in one encounter with Jesus, he completely delivered me. And now I'm sound and I'm safe. I'm in my right mind. And he could do it for you. And he could do it for your loved ones. Right? So the power... The works of Christ. That's why we read the Bible. Because we go, well, I'm in an impossible situation. How could this ever... Is, what, what's going to happen? You know, Is God going to rescue me? Yeah, he just might. <laughs> he might just go across the Sea of Galilee and say, I have an appointment with you. You don't even know it. But I'm going to deliver you. And you will never be the same. You will be forever free. Whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. You know, that's the power that's why we read the Word of God, to remind ourselves, God did it, and He'll do it again. You know, there's a great song that we used to sing, He'll do it again. And I love that message. And God loves to repeat, you know, those, the, you know, uh, things I like, I try twice. Well, God loves to, God loves to kill and deliver and save and rescue and ransom. That's who He is. Amen. He's a delivering, saving God. Right? So when you're in your hopeless situation, yeah, you can just choose to let your faith die and just put your head down and go in the fetal position and give up on life. Hey, you could. It's your choice. There's no reason to, though. I say in that moment, turn to the works of Christ. Remember what he's already done for you, what he's done for others. Read the word of God and read the truth of what God can do and if there's anything impossible for our God. What he's done for them, he can surely do for us. That is the work of Christ. And when situ situations are impossible, beyond anything we can do to change, we can accept the situation as is, or we can turn to the words of Christ. Go to the words of Christ, to the word of God. Search it out, memorize. That's why we memorize the, the promises. His word is faithful and true. It will outlast heaven and earth. Everything will fade. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. God one day will roll it up on a scroll 
and make all things new. It says in the Revelation, you search for those promises of God and you cling to what he says. And no matter what, you know, when or how God chooses to answer, the passage teaches us that we should never fear. Don't be afraid in that hopeless, scary situation. <laughs> That's why we need the Word of God. How many times when you read through this book does it say, don't be afraid? Why? Because there's a million things that makes me afraid. Why? Because there's, I can only control myself. And everything outside of me, man, is out of control. I can't control it. And that's scary. It's no fun, right? But God says, don't worry. I can control it. I can step into the situation. I can do the impossible. <laughs> I'm here, man. I can help you, right? And so it teaches us the wrong response is to be afraid. Don't be afraid. Only believe. You know, the passage t teaches us when you're in that situation, you need to put out every voice of doubt, of fear, of ridicule, of scorn, of people who say it can't be done. It's a choice. I choose to not listen. You know what? I'm putting all of you guys outside. And I'll take with me a few people who have faith in God, who know what he can do. And if I have to go alone, I'll go alone into the secret place with the Lord. You know, do you want to, you could choose to only live in the natural. Everything's a natural consequence. There's nothing we can do. Or you can choose to believe in the work of Christ and the words of Christ, the promises of God, and step into beyond the natural realm and step into the supernatural realm and I would rather say I don't care what anybody else says I want to find out what God says is the answer and the outcome it's not over yet it's not over till it's over until God writes the final verse on it it's not over right Amen. I don't care you don't get to say it's over and I'm not going to believe it's over Jesus, if you're telling me not to be afraid and only believe and go with you, I'm going to go see what you can do. I know I can't do nothing. And I know nobody else can help me, but I know that you can. And I'm with you. I'm sticking with you, Jesus. I'm sticking with you for my family member or maybe, you know, whatever. I don't care what it is. And I will accept his answer. That's why I'm not saying it's a formula. I don't want to sit here and tell you, if you do this and this, every time it will work out. Don't ever let me tell you that. Shout me down if I told you that. I don't know what the outcome is, but I'm going to take God's outcome, whatever He wills. But I'm not going to accept. That's fine. I'll be patient. I'll see what God wants to do in this situation. I don't really care if this you say, oh, this marriage could never be put back together. Oh, you know, there's too much water under the bridge. There's too many wrongs that have been done. That's fine. I don't care. Whatever God says, that's cool. Uh, whatever, I'm just saying, whatever those situations are that, oh, you know, <laughs> don't worry. There'll be plenty of people who tell you there's nothing, it's hopeless. You can't succeed. You know, it'll never change. Whatever it is. That's fine. Whatever. I'll, I'll just wait. I'll go with God. And I will accept from His hand. You know, and, and that's why we have the whole Bible. You know, Job, he said, Shall we only accept good from the hand of the Lord and not evil? You know, the Lord's given, the Lord's taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return when I go back to death. But whatever God wants to do, and what did God want to do? God wanted to restore Job. After all that he went through, didn't he? And so, this passage teaches us, stay the course. Don't be afraid. Do you have Christian, do you have the word of God? Do you have, are all these promises yes and amen in Christ Jesus? Yes and amen they are. 
That's what the Bible says. He is the yes and he is the amen, right? You stick, you stick with him. Let the Lord have the final say. And I'll be like, I'm good with that. I accept that from you, God. But I'm not going to accept any less. You know, God's will. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Is that a good little saying to remember? God's will in this situation. What does he want to do? You know what he wanted to do? He wanted to heal the woman with the issue of blood. She was a daughter that needed healing. And he showed her love and miraculously healed her. What did he want to do with the daughter of Jairus? He wanted to raise her from the dead. He wanted to bring her, give resurrection life back to her. What does God want to do in your life? I don't know, but go with him and find out what it is. And then you can tell your story, right? Do you think these guys had a story to tell? Do you think they became evangelists? And you know what's really cool? Jesus, he never complains that one million, billion people wanted to touch him and throng him. You know he never got annoyed? What is it with all these people? <laughs> Keep your hands to yourself. <laughs> Where's my three foot of personal space? I don't have three millimeters of personal space. Did he ever get upset? Jesus was so happy to have people reach out in faith and go with him and believe. When did he get upset? When they didn't have faith. We're going to get in the next chapter. He was amazed that they didn't have any faith and he could work only very few miracles because no one had faith in him. And so... What a beautiful, what a beautiful passage. How amazing was it for Jairus? His faith needed to hear the testimony that God could heal this impossible situation of this woman for 12 years so that he would have the faith to believe if he could do that. He said, don't be afraid, only believe. I think he's about to do something. I don't even want to dare to hope what I'm thinking. It's like, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Peter, James, John, are you thinking what I'm thinking? I'm thinking he's about ready to raise the dead here. Could it be possible? And he gives that little hint. What are you guys all crying about, man? She's, she's not dead. She's sleeping. This is only temporary, and this is effortless. I'm about ready to raise her. He put out all those without faith. Take people with faith with you, man. When you're going through the deepest and darkest, find that person you really love and respect who will sit there and get on their knees and just say, I'm believing with you. I'm praying for you. I know God will answer. We're believing for his outcome. You know, whatever your problem is, you take it to the Lord Jesus. He's here. He's alive. He's well. Oh, well. He's on the throne. He rose from the dead. The Bible said he sits at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession, to pray, and to work on our behalf as our great, high priest who passed through heavens and earth and through that, back through the heavens where he's seated and where he will return one day for his church. And so Steve, if you will come up and the worship team, you know, whatever it is today, if you need to reach out to Jesus, and maybe you've never given your life to Jesus, or maybe you want to rededicate your life, you're like, hey, I'm not sure. Well, make sure, there's no reason to not make sure when you leave this building that you're in right relationship with the one who could reverse the impossible situation. You know, come into relationship with him. He gave his life on the cross. He bore our sins so that we could be forgiven and free and that he could redeem us. He wants to work in our lives. You know, it's all for the, for the asking and the receiving today. You don't leave here today if you need to pray with someone, if you need to learn how to become a Christian, or whatever it is, you know, you're, you're me today, so. Stand with me this morning as we dismiss. Come